I have here a, uh, a slinky. This is a kid's toy. But a few years ago, I tried out something with it that most people don't often do. It's, it's fairly basic. All I'm going to do is I'm going to dangle the slinky like so. My slinky is extended under its own weight. What I want to do is drop it. What I'm going to ask you to do is predict what will happen when it falls. Obviously, the slinky will fall to the ground. But my question to you is, how will it fall? Will it stay stretched out like this as it's falling? Or maybe the top will fall faster than the bottom? Or perhaps when I let go, the bottom might come up? These are all options that I've heard. But what I'm going to request from you is that you make a prediction right now, and you commit to it. Because scientific research has shown that if you don't make a prediction, what you learn from this will be no more than if you never saw this at all. So has everyone made their prediction? Exactly how the slinky will fall. Now, if I did this live for you, you might not be able to see it. So I have already filmed it beforehand in about 800 frames per second slow motion to make it really clear exactly what happens when the slinky falls. The bottom of the slinky remains completely motionless until the whole slinky has collapsed. It's as though it's defying gravity. Now one thing I know, if a little slinky is good, then a big slinky is even better. See, now we're talking, right? This is not just a phenomenon that slinkies obey. This is the way all objects work. If you hold a steel rod from the top and you let it go, the top of that steel rod really starts falling before the bottom of the steel rod. That is because that release of the tension needs to propagate through the whole material. Now in a slinky, it does it particularly slowly, which allows us to see it. But the takeaway, the real piece of learning that we have here is that disturbances take time to propagate. You think that gravity should be pulling the bottom down immediately when I let go, but the tension is holding it up until it can relax throughout the slinky. Now that you've seen it in slow motion, I bet you can see it live. You guys ready? In three, two, one. Right, you could see that. I bet you anything, if I had dropped it before you had watched this video, you wouldn't have seen it. You would have seen something different. And I think that's remarkable. I mean, we say you need to see it to believe it, but sometimes you need to believe it first. You need to know what's there, what you're looking for, in order to, to actually see it. So that is one of the YouTube, video, YouTube videos that I created. It's actually my first kind of viral success. As you might be able to tell, I am a teacher. This is not a profession. It's a state of being. It's a personality. I was a teacher when I was a kid. I tutored my friends and younger kids. I just get a real kick out of helping people understand something. So I started teaching one-to-one. -one. That's what I did. And after I graduated with a degree in engineering and physics, and I did a PhD in physics education, I was teaching in Sydney in small classes of about 14 students, one to 14. I also started lecturing at university. A uh, few of the universities in Sydney had lecture theaters of 400 students. So I would lecture to these students. And I was kind of scaling my ability to affect people's lives. I'm not sure how effective each one of those scalings was. Obviously, smaller class sizes work better. But now I've got to the point, by using YouTube, that my lessons have reached 250 million views. It's a quarter of a billion views worldwide. I think that's extraordinary. It's an extraordinary opportunity, and it demonstrates the difference that an individual like myself can have. I mean, it was interesting to hear from Paul. You know, Paul wasn't making videos 
as part of his sort of school mandate, he was making them because, like me, he is a teacher, and he wanted to do the best thing for his students, and it just turned out that was also in the best interest of people around the world. So I just want to give you a little taste of what I've been up to. My channel on YouTube is called Veritasium, an element of truth, if you, if you get, get where I'm going with that. But um, I just want to give you an idea of how this came to be. I started making this channel five years ago. There was no funding behind it. There was no organization behind it. There was no real plan. I did this for the love of teaching. So this is what it looks like uh, in about a minute or two, the last five years of my life. I believe science is beautiful. Oh, it feels absolutely incredible. But science is not always intuitive. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. My mission is to help others not fool themselves. What makes water? Um, water. Okay, what elements does it take to make water? H2O. So what does that mean? That it's water. <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between blue light and red light? The color. There wasn't stuff and then there was. Like, where did that stuff come from? Magic. How long does it take for the Earth to go around the sun? What do you reckon, Cuz? <laughs> is it 24 hours? Obviously a day, yes. Sometimes it's best to make people think for themselves. Now, I don't want to give you the answer straight away. I would like you to think about it and perhaps make me a video response. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help people learn, including making a fool of myself. And this allows it to form bonds with its four nearest neighbors. Howdy ho there! Good night. What's up? I said, what is electricity? I do all of this because I want to help others see the beauty of science. <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> oh my goodness, I really like this project. I'm learning something. Hey, the Earth doesn't take one day to get around the sun. It takes like a year. Go. What you do? <laughs> Thank you. So that's what I'm always looking for, that moment when the penny drops, when they make that realization. And it's not just me who is doing this. If you look around the globe, there are dozens of creators who are also teachers, who feel that need to share their knowledge, their excitement for science and technology, for mathematics, to share it with the world. What is interesting is that the people at the top of YouTube and online video who are spreading education, they are not Harvard or Stanford or big government supported or, or major educational institutions. They are individuals. They're people who just took it upon themselves because they needed to share that with the world and that has resonated with the audience. So I always try to consider, you know, why is it? Why is it that, you know, it's been these individuals, you know, each one of these people has a very unique story about how they just came to make a video on the internet to share an idea with the world. And there's something about, about that which is just so compelling for those people watching. It's because we, we're not doing it for the money and we're not doing it for the mandate or, or because it works within our organizational framework. We're doing it because we love it. And for some reason, that is finding an audience and it's really resonating. But I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from the people up on this screen you know, who have been really successful those lessons can be learned. I feel like we're at the beginning of this kind of chain reaction. 
like the way the slinky starts, it starts with a little bit at the top and the rest of the slinky is not moving. In a similar way, I feel like we are just at that moment where the disturbance is starting to propagate through our system. And these are the people at the forefront who are really changing the way education happens. Now you might be tempted to say that these people will revolutionize education. And if that is the inclination, then I'm here to urge caution. Because I did my PhD about how to make films that communicate physics. I tested how well different films work to help people actually learn and understand physics. And when I was doing this research, I came across a troubling history. Let me take you back nearly 100 years to 1922. There was this gentleman, Thomas Edison, who said, the motion picture is destined to revolutionize our educational system, and that in a few years, it will largely supplant, it will supplant largely, if not entirely, the use of textbooks. You go back 100 years, and obviously we know he's wrong. We still use textbooks today. But I hope you recognize that this did not seem like a ridiculous idea when he proposed it. Motion pictures are revolutionary. They changed entertainment. It's, it's extraordinary the impact that they have had on our lives, and yet they have not replaced textbooks. Why not? I think it's a question worth asking. If we don't ask these questions, we're bound to repeat the same mistakes. You can move forward to the 1930s when people believed that radio would be the thing to revolutionize education. There's a lot written about how we can take experts now and beam them directly via radio into the classrooms, and in fact, replace some of the teachers with radios. You could essentially have you know, a babysitter and a radio, and that would take care of your teaching. This was the big idea in the 1930s, and you can see the attractiveness of this, right? To governments who worry about the big budgets of education, you look for ways to make the educational system more efficient. So, in the case of radio, it was this idea that we can take experts, we can get them into classrooms, and we can reduce the costs of teachers. They are expensive, they are difficult to train, it's difficult to get everyone on the same page. I can understand the desire to believe that this would revolutionize education. You can move to the 1950s with TV. Studies were conducted to figure out, do students prefer it more when they are watching the live lecture or if they are in an adjacent room with a TV which displays the lecture? I kid you not, these studies were done with mixed results. In fact, in most of these studies, the result was no significant difference. When you mix up the technology, how does the learning differ? The result is it doesn't that the technology makes virtually no difference. And here, you know, I feel myself echoing Paul again. But people really thought we were onto something in the 1980s. You know why? Because there were computers, and computers are not one way. They are interactive. This is the piece that we thought was missing. This time is different, they would have said back in the 1980s. Computers can really revolutionize education. If we teach kids to code, their, their logic will get better because they're programming the logic of a computer, so they will learn these skills. What happened? They got better at programming the turtle. They did not get better at their logic skills. They get better at the skills that they're being taught. It's kind of no surprise, except that we continue to make these mistakes to this day. Here's an article, the big idea that can revolutionize higher education. I feel like people over the years are invariably drawn to use these words, revolutionize and education. And, and there's this sort of amnesia that we've had a hundred years worth of these predictions, worth of really groundbreaking technologies that have, that have really transformed other areas of our lives, but yet have failed to fundamentally change the way we do education. So I stand here today as a voice of caution to think that the, the future of education is not one of revolutions. This was a note about MOOCs, right? Massive open online courses, right? Again, what is, the, what is the idea here? Taking great teachers and amplifying them out to hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of kids in a highly scalable way that doesn't cost very much, right? We are all looking for this silver bullet, a way to reduce the investment that is needed in education. We want to believe that there is an easy, cheaper solution. 
Now, we talk about can technology revolutionize education. This is what a classroom looked like 100 years ago or more, 150 years ago. What does a classroom look like now? Okay, it's slightly different. It's a little bit more disorganized. The desks are, you know, there's, there's group work possibly happening with those kids. There's, there's clearly technology in places, right? But what does the smart board do that the blackboard didn't? I mean, fundamentally, it doesn't change the game. That's what I'm saying. You still have a teacher here. You still have that person guiding groups of students. Why has this not changed? You may be dismayed at it. You may think this is just the inertia of education and it's impossible to move us forward past, past this step. But I think there might be something else going on here. I think there are some lessons to be learned from all these predictions of education revolutions and their failures. The fact that fundamentally classrooms look very similar. Why is that? Why did the revolutions fail? And for me, a lot of what comes down to is that this is not education, okay? This is a statue uh, from Belgium where we have a, a pupil reading a book and essentially he's pouring the knowledge into his head, pouring the wisdom into his head. That's the metaphor that's being represented here. But my point is what we've learned about education is it's not about a transfer of a thing from A to B. It's not a transfer from the book to the head. It's not a transfer from the teacher to the student. It is not this sort of commodity. I, I hate for education to be thought of as this commodity to be delivered to students. Why is it not that? Why is education not this delivery of information? It's not that because that's not how our brains work. And that's not how information works. The way our brains work is we interact with other people. We engage with our friends, with our families. We tell stories to each other. And through those stories, through those experiences, through those activities that we conduct together, we form memories. Each one of us forms individual memories. And it is out of those memories that our personalities are formed and our understanding of our world forms and our skills develop. I guess what I'm saying fundamentally is education is a social process. And I think it works best when there is a teacher who the students respect, who they feel accountable to, who can inspire them, who can hold them accountable for doing the work of learning. Learning is hard work. And it's important that there's someone there that you feel socially engaged with and that you feel like you have to, you have to do the work for. Just like, I guess, in your jobs, you feel you need to do the work for your boss or there'll be repercussions. I mean, I, I share this view with Paul that the future is not virtual technology, you know, virtual reality. The future is not kids only watching YouTube videos. I like to say that there will be an evolution in education, as there has already been. Our, our tools change, our technologies change, but what is the core, what is the foundation, what is the bedrock of education? It is social interaction between teacher and student and between the students and amongst the students, right? That is the, that is the core of education. So what does a classroom of tomorrow look like? It is an environment where the teachers are, and students are working together. And if there is a way in which I feel social media will transform the future of education, it is not in the delivery of information to the students, it's in what the students will do with social media. And this goes back to the point of making the students into makers. When the teachers can work with the students in such a way that they can leverage social media to have a larger impact on the world, that is where we're going to be seeing the big changes in education. So I see social media not as a deliverer, but as a tool to be used by students to really make their own world and make an impact on the world. Thank you very much.